2019. This is Dr. Duke Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. And we're going to be performing a Duke laser disc repair lumbar today. Three levels, L34, L45, L5S1. Our patient has uh, right leg symptoms of weakness and some sensory changes and I think intermittent back pain. Our patient is joining us from Canada, traveled from Canada to have the endoscopic procedure performed here in Florida. And I think he really came down here because he likes Mickey Mouse. Am I right? Sure, he says. Okay, very good. Well, he has uh, been online watching surgeries for a while and decided to come down and have his own back fixed. So, is there something going on with my microphone over here? Oh, and that, that part's fine, but I just feel like there's something on my hat. No? All right. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, this is the right side. Everybody agrees? Okay, we're going to get started. Sir, you know the routine. You've watched a few of these surgeries, but you're going to be awake for the first, hopefully, just about 10 minutes, as long as I can get to where I need to go quickly. And then we're going to put you to sleep once we actually start the surgery, the actual laser and endoscope part, okay? So here's what I would ask you to do. If you feel pain... Just say, ouch. All right, don't move your body. Don't try to get away or move your body on the table. Just say, ouch, and I'll give you some more uh, pain medicine. A little bit more local anesthetic, okay? Perfect. Anything else you want to tell them? Would you still have our, you know, weakness at all? Would you feel any pump at all, all the way back to your toes? Okay. Yeah, any radiculopathy down your legs or radicular symptoms, you'll let us know. Perfect. Thank you. This is my hand on your back, okay? So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to give you a little bit of numbing medicine. You'll feel a little stick and burn, okay? All right. Now, typically with these types of surgeries, I can usually get all three levels with one incision. However, Sometimes I cannot, and it just depends on the spinal alignment, the plane of the discs. Everybody's a little bit different, but we're certainly going to try. Okay, very good. Now, do you want to make any more positional changes before I get started, or are you comfortable? Perfect. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So... The most difficult disc to access transforaminally is L5-S1. And I always start with L5-S1 if that's needed for that particular patient, as it is with this patient. Shot. All right. You let me know if you feel any pain, okay? All right. Shot. Lateral view. So what I like to do is I like to come in from a lateral approach. I like to dock on the facet joint and just move the, the needle anteriorly through the foramen. That's the safest way to do it. Are we good? Lateral view. All right. Well, so L5S1 should be, I'm not going to say anything to jinx myself, but it should be reasonably shot. Uh, interesting, this, the plane, I'm going to have to go more north. Some more lo local? Yeah, yeah, the angle of the disk space, exactly. Oh, Luis, I like it. Starting to uh, understand, develop countermeasures. All right. 
No, I mean, could it really be that high? Yeah. Shot. Wow. That's just my hand palpating you, okay? I actually would like to be a little higher. I just want to make sure we're numbed up there. You doing okay so far? I think that's better. Let's see if we can make that work. Shot. Should be the facet. All right. Um. Shot. Still quite an angle, huh? Shot. I know. I. <laughs> yeah, that's really quite interesting. Were you uh, you were told you were born with your pars defect shot? Because of the slope of your um, sacrum is so steep that it's certainly possible you developed it during your lifetime. Shot. Yeah, you you what? I didn't hear what you said when you said you were twelve. A lot of hay bales. Hay bales. Yeah. Well, it's just that your sacral end plate is so steep, so steeply vertical, like Dr. Santiago said, that it's entirely possible that you actually um, fractured it. You know, doing something when you were younger. Shot. Let's go with a. Uh, let's go with an AP real quick. Uh huh. When was the accident? I see. Did you have back pain at the time? After the accident, you had back pain? How long after the accident? Lateral. And it was right at the L5S1 region? Yeah, you, you could have fractured it then. That's certainly possible. <coughs> and likely. I'm just amazed at um, your anatomy because your, your L5S1 disc is so steep that uh, we really start quite high up on your back <laughs> to get to it. It's not, not a problem. We're going to get the job done, but um, it's just very different, you know? Shot. It's okay. You're doing fine. Now, you're going to let me know if you feel any discomfort, right? I can feel all the scar tissue. Shot. I can feel all the scar tissue from your fracture. There's a really quite a bit of it. Shot. You feeling anything yet? No. Nothing at all, right? No. Shot. This is uh, definitely a challenge. Um, AP. L5S1 is challenging normally, but with your listhesis and uh, the angle 
but the angle is, is actually, in a way, it's favorable because it makes me go more north up towards your head, more rostrally, which is better than having to go caudal. All right, so we're almost at the mid-pedicular line, which is good. Back to a lateral, please. Pretty much at the mid-pedicular line, which is good. And yeah, what I was saying is when, you, when people get pars fractures, I've operated on a lot of these people with pars fractures, and they have a tremendous amount of callus formation around the fracture area. A lot of like thick collagen, scar tissue, et cetera. Are you feeling anything at all? No. Yeah, Where? But it went down your leg. Down your leg. Okay, that's what I needed to know. I'm going to have to come a little steeper. Shot. 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 Uh, it's that thick scar tissue again, which is okay. Shot. 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 All the way down? Yes. Tell me if it's better. better. That's just my hand palpating you. Let's um, come south a little bit, just a small bit, and let's get the table up a smidgen. Good. Let's see where we are. Our end plate seems to be lined up nicely, right? Are you seeing any rotation there? I'm not. Huh? No. No, I can see. Shot. Again, it's the steepness. As I come in low, it's forcing me north. So I need to go higher. But that takes me, probably going to take me out of the zone for doing the other levels, which need to be done lower, I think. But we'll see. We'll start with 5-1 and see what happens. Shot. Shot. 
shot. It's too high. Shot. 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 I'm trying to come in as low as I can. Shot. AP. So we're starting with the hardest level. I don't expect um, much difficulty with the others, but I'm still working on L5S1. All right, lateral. Maybe you can bring the collimator in a little bit. Give us a better picture. Shot. Shot. One more time. Uh, that's pretty good. Shot. Let's go to an AP. Not right now, Luis. Let's go back to a lateral. Interesting. Shot. Shot. That's the low facade. Shot. 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 There's that scar tissue shot. Shot. Tons of scar tissue. Shot. Shot. AP. Are you comfortable, sir? Right now you have pain in your buttock a little bit? Right. All right, lateral. It's so grainy. Can we do anything about that? That's too grainy. Shot. That's better. All right. 
so um, yeah let's try we may be too high for the other levels but we will certainly try we have to make the incision here anyway good morning where do you go Well, you didn't make it easy for me, that's for sure. Shot. You did, you did, and I shot. Is that it? And you, I thought you were apologizing prematurely, but you knew what you were talking about. You've done what? Oh, so you know. Did you know yours would be so difficult? Let's get that L45. I need I need the floral lower or I need the table up. Table up. Is your floral all the way down? Shot. And I want that L uh, L5 super end plate lined up perfectly. How come we're so grainy? Is it because we're pulsing? Okay. That's fine. I think we're okay. Shot. You know, trajectory isn't so bad, after actually, from here. Shot. 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 Uh huh. So I'm kind of liking it, but we're just a little bit too um, medial. Shot. 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 A little bit higher than I want to be. Shot. Oh, way too low. Shot. How's our patient doing? Good? Shot. Are you comfortable, sir? Shot. You got some big facets, shot. 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 Are you in Patel Clinic today? Yes. Shot. Shot. So this is that facet that's uh, unfortunately due to his listhesis. You can see it's separated. Shot. Shot. I need to go further south. Shot. This is the place where the big herniation is. Anything? Shot. Shot. AP. All right. So what is your training in? Is it in anesthesia or in physiatry? Very nice. All right. Well, hmm. All right, we're gonna test those in just a minute. Let's get this last one in and see what, what it shows. Lateral.
You doing okay so far? I need that L34 end plate lined up nicely. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Shot. 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 All right. Shot. So for our viewers, we're um, doing the basically the first step of the Duke laser disc repair, which is gaining access to the disc space through a transforaminal approach, meaning trans means through. Foramen is the neural foramen. And shot. And what you're seeing are x-ray pictures. We use the x-ray shot because the target is um, is not a bony target, but it's a joint between two bones shot. And really the only way to see it and visualize it is going to be uh, using an x-ray machine shot. You feel anything there, shot? All right, shot. You're doing really good. I'm hoping to be able to have you asleep soon. Shot. But I just need your help for a little bit longer. Shot. We're entering the L34 foramen. Shot. I can feel the foramenal ligament. I can feel your herniation. Shot. AP. Yeah. I can feel the herniation there. In the foramen. Wow, look at that. 5 1, how steep it is. It's perfect. All right, go back to a lateral. Hmm. Shot. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Shot. Shot. Give me, I need to see further down. AP. Are you pulsing? Just take it off pulse for a moment. So we can get a nice clean picture. That's in the disc. You see that? You agree? Yeah. All right, let's go back to the lateral. Have you felt anything at all? No. Show me. Are you pulsing? I don't want you to pulse. Right? That's non-pulsed? Uh, not much difference. Do you have the collimators closed down so we can direct the energy where it needs to be and not just everywhere? All right. I don't need I need the uh, next tube. Yeah, more than one, right? All righty. <coughs> You still comfortable? Shot? Good, we're in the disc. 
I, I, want, I need to see the front of the disc. I don't need to see the back. I need to see the front. There we go. All right. That's exactly right. That's L45. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? And it's worse. The worst that it got. 8. All right. And that's back pain or any leg symptoms? Well, then I tested L5S1 earlier, and you didn't have any pain, right? No. That was L4-5. So you have discogenic pain at L4-5. Is that your typical pain? That's pretty close. Yeah, so it's concordant. So you have concordant pain at, at uh, L4-5. We still need to do 5-1 because you have a herniation and you have a pinched nerve there. That's 3-4. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? 9 out of 10, is that where your pain is typically? All right, so you see the value of discography, right? Evocative discography. I don't know if you use that in your practice or not, but it is extremely valuable. It's the best tool there is in the world for determining if a patient has discogenic pain. Now, I didn't tell you I was injecting, did I? So you were blind to the fact that I was injecting, but you certainly had a response. Absolutely. Now, you didn't respond to 5-1. Why is that? Because it's not causing pain. But you responded to 4-5 and 3-4. Why? Because they're causing pain. Is 5-1 herniated? It is herniated. 3-4, 4, 4 5, 5 one are all herniated, but 5-1 didn't cause pain on the discogram because it's not causing your daily pain. But you're not really here for back pain, you're here for your leg symptoms. So we're really doing 5-1 for the radiculopathy rather than for, yes, we're doing it for the radiculopathy weakness rather than axial discogenic pain. But there are millions and millions of people living with back pain of the kind that you felt when I injected 3-4 and 4-5 and reproduced your pain. And that's the disc. Has nothing to do with the facet joint or the muscles. Five, f five one is zero, and then four, five was eight, I think, and then three, four was nine. And they're both concordant. I don't know what you're. It's zero. There, no, it, there's no pain at all. You can only have concordant when there's pain. If there's no pain, you don't have anything. Okay, well it's time for you to go nighty night. When you wake up, I'll be done. Yes, sir, my pleasure. It's an honor to take care of you, sir. For our whole team, too. Thank you for coming here and trusting us. All right, go ahead and count from one to 100 by ones out loud. Okay, lateral. All right, so you can see we're starting at 3-4. And thank God we have the endoscope to be able to see what we're doing because the x-ray picture is not so good. You're doing great, keep counting out loud. Huh? That's fine. You take your time and you go slow and safe. Yeah. His neck is bothering him. May need to do some facets. All right. So for those of you watching and for our patient who will be watching later, we're going to start at 3-4. Um, I was able to get one incision. For those of you who can see, everything is being done with one incision. Now, if this patient wasn't having the Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic repair of his three herniated disc in his lower back, he'd be having an incision to do open surgery that would literally be 10 inches to 12 inches long from here to here. Okay, and he would be having screws and rods and cages put in. That screws and rods and cages surgery is a decompression infusion. I've done those many times. I've done a thousand of those surgeries in my 
career of 22 years, okay? So I've done a thousand of the open surgeries, huge incisions, screws and rods, but instead he didn't want that, he wanted the endoscopic repair. Now the fusion and the endoscopic are gonna give him the same result, exactly the same. 95% relief of his back pain and 95% relief of his right leg symptoms. In his case, mostly weakness. Okay, is he ready? Should I, should I proceed or wait? All right, so we're advancing the dilator along the guide wire. You wanna make sure the guide wire doesn't move, shot doesn't move into the um, abdomen or pelvis. So you can see it's staying right where it's supposed to be. You can actually see the herniation in front of the dilator, that lump. Um, that's the dye going into the herniation and kind of outlining it, shot in the foramen. That's right where his nerve is being pinched. Now you can see the tip of the dilator is up against the herniation and our patient is asleep, thank God, otherwise he'd be responding with uh, some movement that's reflexive. He can't control it and those are your subconscious pathways. You, your spinal tracts that are very old and they go to brain stem areas that control reflex movements, subconscious. You don't even know about it. Shot. Whereas the newer pathways of pain that have developed over the last few million years um, go to other areas of the brain that are newer. Shot. Is that my shot right there? Cerebral cortex. And there's a somatotopic localization. Shot. All right, I'm happy. We are inside the disc at 3-4 with the dilator. We're now gonna bring my tubular ret retractor. So for everybody who's never seen a Duke laser disc repair spinal surgery, you're watching the most advanced spine surgery in the world. This is not the most complex spine surgery in the world, it's the most advanced spine surgery in the world. So all the open surgeries that are done for degenerative conditions are all done for stenosis, for degenerated discs, and this surgery is going to replace the open surgeries that are being done. So for degenerative spinal condition, the endoscopic disc repair that I'm doing will replace 95% of spinal fusions, artificial discs, laminectomies, microdiscectomies, all those surgeries are done and they're not as good as this procedure because they require big incision, removing bone from the spine. We're not gonna take any of this patient's natural bone out. So we're not gonna destabilize his spine at all. Um, by doing open surgery, the surgeon has to remove bone and ligaments that are normally there to stabilize the spine. So they're going to make the spine more unstable, which is why we have to do fusions often because you don't want to leave a patient with an unstable spine. They're going to come back again in a short time and have a, a fusion done. So you just do it all at the same time. I do fusions all the time. Uh, they work very well in my hands, but this is a much better surgery because it doesn't involve opening the body and it doesn't involve screws and rods. Shot. Now he's moving a little bit, so he's feeling discomfort, but again, it's all reflex. Shot. He's not um, consciously aware, he's just reflexively moving because he's using reflex pathways like vestibulospinal pathway, rubrospinal, though that's primarily motor, but um, shot. I'm very happy with the positioning of our cannula, uh, AKA tubular retractor. So the alternative surgery for this patient to give him a good outcome would be an open fusion, which would be a very, very big surgery and he would be, take a long time to recover. Our patient should be up walking around in the recovery area within an hour. Whereas a fusion is a much longer recovery. So this whole surgery is done through this little metal tube. Zach, we have any questions from our audience? Uh, we do have one, actually. Um, awesome. We have a viewer who's saying, <coughs> um, my L4-5 S1 uh, needs surgery. I've been having spasms, and I've had to go to the ER room every time they start. Um, yes. Is surgery the only option to f help that? So uh, there's a, somebody watching who's saying, I'm having horrible pain coming from L4-5, L5-S1. I have to go to the emergency room because the pain is so bad. Is surgery the only option? The answer is no. Uh, we need to know why you have pain. So, so far you haven't told me. You said it's L45, L5S1, but is it, is it the facet joint? Is it the disc? Is it the sacroiliac joint? 
The only thing that needs surgery, from my standpoint at this point, is your, if you had disc pain, like this patient, if you had symptoms coming from the disc. But we don't know that um, until we've done a workup. And that usually involves more diagnostic tests, possibly some injections. So my answer is no. I don't know that you're going to need surgery at this point. I would not just jump into surgery. I can do a free MRI review. Duke Spine Institute offers a free MRI review for anyone that wants it. And we can do a video conference as well. There's no obligation. And uh, yeah, there's no obligation to treat. Um, you're welcome to have it. it it's usually about a 15 minute uh, video conference where I can answer questions for you and I can look at your MRI and make recommendations. If your pain is coming from a bad disc, then surgery is the only way to fix it. If your pain is coming from the facet FACET joints, then the best treatment is a rhizotomy and physiotherapy. If your pain is coming from the sacroiliac joint, then your best treatment is injections and therapy. Now, if the injections and therapy don't work for the facet joint and the SI joint, the next step would be a um, rhizotomy. So a rhizotomy of the SI joint, and the next step for the facet joints would be uh, surgery to remove them and fuse. So it just depends on the source of your pain. I, it's really hard for me to answer it without knowing where your pain's coming from. Okay, Luis, in general, I need a little bit more on the camera yes, sir. on these cables. Okay, so please make sure I have a little more room. All right, so we're inside the L34 disc. You can see that it has the typical appearance of a damaged disc. It's been injured with a tear, herniation, and some degeneration. And we're pretty deep in, and you can still see that there's a lot of uh, scar tissue from the inflammation. See that scar tissue right there? That's a piece of herniation that's so scarred up it's literally like a rock. It's concrete. It's got dystrophic calcification. It's got a lot of collagenization. So this has been a condition going on for a while. There's also some soft disc here that's a little bit easier to deal with with the laser. But the older the injury, the harder it is in terms of scar tissue and um, calcification. The body tends to scar and then calcify damaged tissue. So Whenever you see scarring and calcification, you know that that injury has happened uh, sometime in the past. The more scarring and calcification there is, the older the injury. That's especially true with these discs that I fix. So there's a tear right there. You can see the tear. It's been going on for a long time. I can't disclose too much information about our patient because that's all protected. Certainly can't disclose his identity. But I can tell you that this, pa this per patient that I'm operating on has been dealing with pain for a long time in more ways than one. Right, doctor? Yes. Typically dealing with other people's pain. And that brings up a great point, you know. Since there's no questions right now, I like to talk about issues surrounding pain and pain management. A lot of people think they feel bad for some people who are in pain. They have back pain or neck pain. We all feel bad for the patient, right? But what we typically don't think about is their family and their friends and their, their work, their employer, so to speak. When people have daily back pain or daily leg pain or neck pain and arm pain, they literally suffer every day, but so does the people that care about them. Their children, their spouses, their parents. People worry, you know, about someone who's suffering in pain. We all know someone who's had chronic pain, and we know that we worry about that person. We see how the pain changes their lives. Chronic pain doesn't make people's lives better. It makes their lives worse. And so anytime you have something making your life worse, typically people will address it they'll get rid of it, you know? And um, unfortunately, when it comes to fixing back pain or neck pain, there's very few places in the world that can get rid of it. Duke Spine Institute is one of those places. So it's not like you can, if you're hungry, what do you do, right? Take laser standby, grab her. If you're hungry, your stomach's in pain. It hurts. 
And what do you do? You just go and get something to eat, right? You go to the grocery store, you go to McDonald's, you go to wherever you go to eat. I don't go to McDonald's personally, but some people do. The point is you can fix your pain quickly, right? You can fix your pain quickly. If your eye hurts, you rub it. If your stomach hurts, you put food in it, you know? So we, ha we all have strategies that we have for dealing with pain, but when you, someone has chronic back pain, there's really very little they can do to, to fix it on their own. Sure, they can, there's a piece of herniation. They can uh, certainly, so that was inside the disc, but the reason it's inside is because we pushed it inside with the dilator. Right, remember when I shoved the dilator in? It actually pushes the herniated fragments inside the disc, which is one of the advantages of this technique that I'm using. It's called the inside out. And you start inside the disc and you work out. Now that was something taught to me by Dr. Anthony Young, who is, I call him Yoda, the Yoda of endoscopic spine surgery. I'm more like the, uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of endoscopic spine surgery. Dr. Young is like the, the Yoda. He's the, the grand master. And um, I don't know who the Luke Skywalker is. Yeah. Huh? I, I Maybe if I was younger, I'd be Luke Skywalker, but I'm more of an Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of age kind of person. But we're looking for the, the Luke Skywalker. And I would love to train the Luke Skywalker so I haven't found a Luke Skywalker yet. Still searching. All right, as we pull back, you can see how messed up this disc is. This is 100% not normal. And we know this disc was causing his pain. Now, when I first looked at this patient's MRI, I saw that L45 and L5S1 were the worst. And originally, we talked about doing L45, L5S1. But once the patient came in and I examined the patient, I realized we were dealing with a problem at L3-4 as well. So we actually talked about doing L all three discs instead of just two. And of course, this patient traveled from out of the state. They traveled from Canada to come here and have this surgery done. So my point is really quite simply that it's impossible for a really good pain, pain, pain doctor, a doctor who treats pain, to know 100% just based on an MRI uh, where a patient's pain is coming from. You really need a physical exam. The physical exam is so important in determining pain because the kind of pain that I can fix with this surgery is what's called localized pain, okay? It's pain that the patient feels localized to their lower back, to a very specific area. And when I examine the patient, I can see, the first question I ask every single patient is, put one finger on the spot that hurts the most. And that is something that I've done now for many, many years, and it's part of my success in treating patients, is that I can localize their pain and figure out where it's coming from. If a doctor doesn't do that, they have no chance of fixing your pain. I can tell you that right now. They're just being flying uh, blind. So if your doctor doesn't like have you show them exactly where their pain, your pain is, on your back or your neck, then there's no way they're gonna be able to tell based on an MRI. An MRI will never ever tell a doctor where pain is coming from, ever. An MRI only shows you structural abnormalities, okay? And 100% guarantee you, put my entire, I'll give you my motor home if you can prove me wrong, okay? And my, uh, my RV. But there's no way you can know where pain is just from an MRI. It's impossible. It's impossible. So you have to do a physical exam. Many times there's granulation tissue, by the way, that's the pink color. I was telling this patient about this before surgery. I said, the disc is definitely a source of pain and the pain comes from the annulus fibrosis. It comes from the walls of the tear on the side where there's granulation tissue growing in from chronic inflammation. Um, so anyway, what I was trying to say to you all is it's impossible for a doctor to tell where your pain's coming from based on an MRI, a CAT scan, an X-ray. It's not possible. So most of the time you need a physical exam combined with the MRI or CAT scan 
but um, a lot of times we also need diagnostic blocks where we numb up joints to figure out where is the pain coming from. Standby laser. We have a question. Yeah, just let me finish. MRIs and CAT scans and x-rays only show you structural findings, okay? They show you structural abnormalities. Structural abnormalities do not equal pain. And I'm gonna tell you an example why. Japan, uh, they did a study in Japan a couple of years back where they took a uh -huh, thousand people off the street. A thousand people that were normal. They had no neck pain, no symptoms in their arms. They were perfectly normal people. And they did an MRI of their cervical spine. And guess what they found? They found that 90% of those people that it were totally normal and never had a complaint of neck pain, they had herniated discs, okay? That's a, very telling tell, that's a very telling experiment. It tells you that just because your MRI shows a structural abnormality, which is a herniated disc, it does not mean it causes pain. And remember, that was 1,000 people, 90% of them had herniated disc or one or more in their neck, and none of them had symptoms, zero. So very important to understand, you cannot rely on just the MRI you must have a good, di uh, good exam and a really competent clinician to figure out where your pain is coming from. And I will tell you this, virtually all of our patients need some type of a diagnostic block as well to help us figure it out, or a discogram, some type of an evocative test or some type of a block. But you need additional information. And I can tell you this, no, there's no doctors out there that do that except for interventional pain management doctors usually. Some orthopedic surgeons are able to, some neurosurgeons are able to do their own tests, but a lot of times you need a comprehensive center that has multiple specialists, including interventional pain management, surgery, and therapy in order to uh, accurately diagnose a patient's source of pain. If you can't accurately diagnose a source of pain, you're not gonna be able to fix it. All right, you can see the end plate at three o'clock. It's really scarred up. This is really scarred up herniation. I'm just working on laterally, and I will take the question. Go ahead, Zach. All right, we have a viewer asking, uh, what is the best treatment for L5, L4-5 disc degeneration with disc perfusion and compression of the right nerve root in lateral recess? Uh, had ongoing pain for 10 weeks at the side of the disc over time. Um, Pain's gone, but now the main issue, or excuse me, the uh, has gone, but now the main issue is pain in right leg, calf, and weakness in toes and ankle. The pain is eased, but I'm left with weakness in the right leg. Okay, so we have an, a viewer who's saying, um, I have a herniated disc with right foraminal stenosis. I think they said L5S1, is that correct? It's L4-5. L4-5. What's the best treatment? The best treatment in the world is the surgery you're watching right now. What are your treatment options? You can have a laminectomy, you can have a microdiscectomy, you can have a fusion, you can have an artificial disc. You can have an X-stop or interspinous device, and you can have the Duke laser disc repair, the surgery you're watching right now. Of all those options, the best option in my opinion by far is the endoscopic surgery you're watching right now, the Duke laser disc repair. The problem you're gonna encounter is that there are many surgeons that know how to do this kind of surgery. So they're all gonna wanna do open surgery on you which means they're gonna cut you open and they're gonna be taking out bone usually, uh, which you don't want done. They're taking out normal bone that you don't want done. They have to take the normal bone out to get down to the uh, part of the spine, the herniated disc that's causing the problem. So it's, the reason is, is because of their surgical approach, the way they do the surgery. They have to actually harm your spine in order to help your spine or your nerve. I know it sounds crazy, but that's exactly what it is. And I was taught to do things the same way. And, and that's the way that a lot of surgeons have been taught to do it. But then I heard about this technique that I'm doing right now, the endoscopic surgery, and how you don't have to remove any bone. And I wanted to learn about it, so I went over overseas and I learned from the Koreans, South Koreans that were doing it. Dr. Seng Ho Lee and Dr. Gun Choi and a German surgeon, okay? Um, and so I learned from those doctors and, and an English surgeon how to do endoscopic surgery for the lower back, okay? And I took what they were doing and I made it much better. 
okay? And so now we have the Duke laser disc repair. Now, none of those people except the Koreans were operating on the neck, cervical herniations. But that is the, this is the best surgery in the world available. I know that, I've, I've done all the different kinds of surgeries, microdiscectomies, laminectomies, endoscopic surgery, fusions, I do them all, artificial discs. I do them all, I've done them all many times. I know exactly what's gonna happen, how the patients are gonna do, and by far, this endoscopic surgery I'm doing right now is the best by far. It's the fastest recovery, it's the safest surgery, it's had zero complications in 13 years. I've done a thousand of them with zero complications. You can't say that for any other surgery in the spine. There's no other surgery in the world on the spine that has zero complications, but this surgery, okay? Plus you get 95% relief of back and leg pain, 95%. That's the average for my patients. I mean, what other spine surgery in the world has 95% relief of back and leg pain? And there's no metal put in your body. No metal, no plastic, no artificial disc, nothing that can pop out or break or move around where to go somewhere it shouldn't. We've had no infections. We've had no nerve damage, no spinal fluid leaks, no complications. And by the way, the surgery is done outpatient without a hospital. So you don't even go to the hospital for the surgery. Whereas most of the other surgeries, you're gonna go to the hospital. So you tell me what's better. To me, it's a no brainer. I mean, I've just talked about a couple of reasons why this surgery is the best, but um, there's lots of reasons. And believe me, I actually do all the other surgeries. I've been trained to do them, I've done them, uh, but this by far is the best surgery. All right, is there another question, Zach? We're just about done here. You can see um, I'm, I've got a little bit of foraminal ligament right here. There's a little bit more of the herniation, but not much. And we're, you're looking at the end plate of one vertebral body and the end plate of the other. And we're right in what's called Kambin's triangle, K-A-M-B-I-N, named after Parvis Kambin, Dr. Parvis Kambin was the first surgeon in the world back in the 70s to do a lumbar endoscopic transforaminal surgery. He was a faculty member at, at uh, Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical School. I think he was maybe even at Allegheny. I can't remember exactly where he was, but it was definitely in Pittsburgh. And uh, he was the pioneer of lumbar transforaminal endoscopic mm. surgery that everyone learned from. Um, Unfortunately, he had a lot of complications because he was the pioneer. And he, um, the instruments that he was using were modified and they weren't really the best shape or design for what he was trying to do because nobody had ever done it before. So I give him a lot of credit for being a pioneer, but at the same time, standby laser. He, uh, he had a lot of complications because of the uh, equipment he had that he designed and of course he didn't know any better um huh <laughs> right he had to develop the technique and and of course you know before dr camden did develop the technique there were doctors putting needles transforaminal um you know all the time for probably a hundred years before that right but he's the guy who thought, well, gosh, if we're putting a needle in the transforaminal space to access the disc and do a discogram or a myelogram, um, then why can't, we, why can't we put a guide wire and bring in some surgical instruments, right? And that's exactly what he did. So guide wire-based surgery has really blossomed over the last 30 years where a, a surgeon will put in a wire under x-ray control or you know some other form CT now and then they'll put uh, tools down the wire you know guiding by the wire so the wire guides the tools to the right place without making a big skin incision so it's part of the minimally invasive spine surgery or surgery technique is to use guide wires and I've been using guide wires since residency but never um, not like this okay this was something I learned after residency and it just highlights another point, which is I went to literally one of the best residency programs in the world for neurosurgery, one of the top three, 
University of Florida in Gainesville at the time with Dr. Roten. And um, they weren't doing the surgery. You know, they knew a little bit about it, but they didn't know how to do it. Um, and they were starting to do endoscopic brain tumor surgery, like pituitary tumors. I learned how to do that endoscopically and microscopically and microendoscopically. But nobody was doing spine surgery endoscopically when I was in training, except the Bonatti Institute and Laser Spine Institute. All right, so it was a new technology back then. That was many years ago. And it's still relatively new because a lot of surgeons don't know how to do this kind of surgery. They're not trained to do it in their residency. And surgeons typically do what they're trained to do in their residency or fellowship. They don't really, after they've done with their fellowship training and their residency training, they rarely go out and learn new techniques. Rarely, it's not common. Um, stem cells are an example of a new technology that they're learning. Most doctors are learning that have already been in practice. They're learning from the reps and the companies that sell that stuff. But um, the company that sells the equipment that I use, they really don't do much, much training or workshops, unfortunately. And that's uh, Wolf out of Germany. Uh, not sure why they don't, but they don't. I don't know why, but they should. This is the best technology for spine in the world. And uh, if I owned Wolf in Germany, I would be very actively promoting the use of this technology. But they're very uh, passive and I don't know the right terminology for it. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I would usually say they're stupid, but I think that's not very politically correct. All right, so pretty happy here. We're, we've gotten 90% of this herniation out at 3-4. How's he doing? Good. And uh, what you can see at 12 o'clock is really, if I pull back the tube any further, you're going to see the fat in the uh, foramen and epidural space. You might see some veins that are in the epidural space. But this is all calcified concrete, herniated disc, bone spurs, and I've removed it all with a laser. And all we have left is just a little bit um, of the uh, disc material. And then you have the, the posterior longitudinal ligament right there at 12 o'clock. You can see the fibers, or the white fibers right there running from left to right. All right, standby laser. So we're gonna come out. There's our fat, epidural space. And if I look north, we should see a nerve root up here. And there it is inside the fat right there. And that's where the herniation was and it's gone. I might get a little bit more of that. Let me have that laser. Any more questions, Zach? We have a question. Sure. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, is this type of surgery always considered to be the best option? Is this type of surgery always considered to be the best option? That's the question. So the answer is it depends on what we're treating. Um, if we're treating cancer, it's not the best option, unless the cancer is right in the foramen in the back of the disc. If we're treating deformity where the spine is falling apart, needs screws and rods, this is not the best option. But what I was trying to say earlier is, um, for those of you interested, spine surgery falls into categories, okay? So it's kind of like, um, um, I, don't, I don't know what the right analogy would be, but um, all spine surgery falls into, I think about four categories, okay? There's degenerative, there's tumor, there's infection, there's deformity, and then there's pediatric. So however many categories that is. Um, the vast majority of spine surgery, about 90% of it, is, uh, is degenerative, which is what we're treating with this surgery, degenerative. So 95% of spine surgery done in the world is degenerative for disc degeneration, spinal stenosis, herniated disc, bulging disc, 
Um, the rest of the surgery is done for tumors, infections, uh, pediatric deformity called idiopathic scoliosis that doesn't respond to conservative treatment, and then, of course, adult deformity. Now, adult deformity can also be done with this surgery, not screws and rods, standby laser, but uh, most adult deformity, in my opinion, doesn't need screws and rods. It can be treated appropriately by fixing the disc. The deformity itself is not the source of the patient's dysfunction. Usually the disc still is. So what I'm saying is 95% of spine surgery done in the world, this surgery could be the best, would be the best option because that 95% of surgery done for the spine is degenerative. And this is the best degenerative surgery in the world. Now there's a few things where we can't use this surgery in degenerative spine, and that's really bad instability, or um, like a, fa a facet joint cyst, called the synovial cyst. Um, if the patient has, for example, like a bamboo spine or something, where everything is severely calcified, that won't work, but those are very rare. So I would say for 95% of the spine surgeries done in the world, this is probably your best option. That's a generalization. Okay, so we've, we're done with the L34. We know that was a painful disc. We tested it with discography, and the patient had nine out of 10 concordant pain. Concordant means it's his typical pain that he does get in his lower back. Um, discordant means we created a pain that they've never had before and they, uh, we call that discordant. So concordant, C-O-N-C-O-R-D-A-N-T means pain that the patient typically experiences. So we're done with one out of three. We're going to get started on the second one and I think I'm going to do the, um, the L4-5 next. So let's go ahead and get the guide wire in. and shot. So why will you as a person, why would you go to your doctor and not find, not hear about endoscopic surgery? The reason is simple. The doc, the surgeons out there don't know how to do it. So shot. It's kind of like saying, okay, um, what's the best, you know, fighter jet out there? And if all you know how to make are like you know, the kind of jets that they used back in World War II, then you're going to say that's the best jet out there. But if you know how to make a stealth bomber, you know, you're going to say that's the best jet. So the problem is a lot of surgeons shot, they don't know how to do this surgery. So they're not going to recommend this surgery to their patient. They should recommend the surgery to the patient ethically, morally, but they don't. They're going to tell the patient the best surgery is whatever they do. And that's why you, you as a patient or somebody thinking about having surgery, you need to do your research. You need to really understand what options are available for you. And I know how hard it is because I'm a patient too. Shot, I've seen the doctor before and I'm worried about the same issues you are. Shot, I worry about, okay, is this surgeon really going to fix my problem, right? And shot, are they going to actually hurt me while they're fixing my problem? Are they going to make me worse than I already am? We all worry about that. That's normal to worry about that. And you should worry about it, by the way. I recommend you do worry about it because it does happen. Surgeons, for one reason or another, are not perfect, obviously. We all make mistakes, but some surgeons are really bad and you want to avoid them. You really want to avoid them. I would avoid them. And so I would tell you, the people I'm teaching shot, to avoid them as well. Because I would want the same for you as I would want for myself. And if a surgeon is not gonna give you the best surgery with the best results, Looks like the guide wire is trapped. I need I need to see further anterior. Can you not see that? You can't lower this fall? Yeah, just a little bit. Good. Shot. All right, that's better. I don't know why we're so overexposed. 
So I say this, you know, because I'm passionate about it, that I really want everyone to get the very best care possible. And I want people to have access to the best care possible. Uh, and really the best care, what I mean by the best care possible is not the best care that you can get where you are, but the best care available in the world for your problem. So here, take this. <coughs> when, I, uh, when I have patients that come see me for a brain tumor shot, <coughs> I don't do brain tumor surgery on them because I'm not the best neurosurgeon to do brain tumor surgery. You understand? Give me an AP. I'm not the best surgeon to do brain tumor surgery. So I refer those patients out to who I think is really good. If they have, if my patient has an aneurysm, I don't do the aneurysm surgery. I send the patient out, perfect lateral. I send the patient to who I think is the best aneurysm surgeon. So what I'm telling you is doctors should do what's right for the patient, which is be aware, number one, that the patient has a problem that they're not the best to treat. And then number two, try to make themselves aware of who the best is to treat that problem. If they're gonna refer the patient out, have an idea of where they should go to get really good care. No, yeah. I mean? We have a question. Yeah. Uh, wherever you're asking, uh, what's the previous disc, did the previous disc have a normal amount of herniation? Did the previous disc have a normal amount of herniation? So um, the answer is yes. Normal, there really is no one specific normal. I've seen small herniations. I've seen giant herniations. I've seen everything in between cause patient symptoms. Um, the size of the disc herniation really doesn't matter, except that when you get really big ones, they start to push on nerves really bad, and they push on the spinal cord. And then you get into a different situation where you can have actually a, um, a patient who's going paralyzed. And so I would say that his, his herniation that I just treated was pretty much average for what I'm used to seeing. And it's certainly within the range of normal, but it's just probably average shot. It wasn't anything um, worse than I'm typically see. It wasn't anything better shot. Hmm. Thing keeps coming out. You see that shot? A lot of intradiscal pressure here. Not sure why, but we're gonna find out. Okay, let's get the flow out. So we're now treating the um, L45. So I just wanted you to be here just to get some more experience. And Patel is in clinic. All right. Does he need help? Does he have a busy clinic? It is? All right. So maybe, you know, this you can go back to help him, sure. but be, be available for the start of the next case. Sure. Take that. All right. Beautiful. So we're inside the disc, and what you're looking at right there, folks, that blue thing is the herniation and to me that looks like a softer herniation it's not as scarred up so this is the worst level we know L45 is the worst level based on the MRI he has a really big herniation here which I think I've shoved into the disc pretty good so why is it blue? It's blue because we use a vital dye during our discogram procedure to stain the uh, tissue. And with the vital dye stains, it stains the degenerated nucleus propulsus. So it will not stain a normal nucleus propulsus. So the normal nucleus propulsus is white. So if you see a white nucleus propulsus, it's either scarred heavily or it's normal. And uh, this is blue, so it's not normal. This is part of the herniation. And that's why the dye is so helpful. It helps me see what's normal, what's not normal. Hey, I'm having trouble rotating this. You need to give me a little more. So for those of you watching the surgery, you're watching a live spine surgery if you're watching today, September 17, 2019. 
unless you're watching later when it's recorded. And we're broadcasting from Duke Spine Institute here in Melbourne, Florida. We're located in the Space Coast of Florida. We broadcast all of our surgeries live with patient's consent, of course. And um, we broadcast for educational reasons to educate the public about state-of-the-art spine surgery. We broadcast live so I can answer questions during surgery so that people can understand the relationship of things. If they have a question about what is that blue stuff or what is that fiber? The blue thing coming up and down and wiggling, that's the laser fiber. It's about half a millimeter in width. It's 550 microns, which is half a millimeter. It's 0.5 millimeter, just to give you an idea of the size of things. And you're looking through a tube, a small metal tube. That's the walls on the side, the metal walls. It's like being inside of a straw, a metal straw. I always use the McDonald's shake straw that's about the width of a McDonald's shake straw or any shake straw. And so we're inside the straw. The straw goes from the outside where we are, where I'm standing, all the way through the body and into the disc, the disc herniation specifically. It literally enters the disc right where the herniation is in the foramen and lateral recess. So that's what we're looking at. Now this area here is a bit more scarred up. Still blue. This is more lateral. This is uh, annulus, part of the annular debridement. All right, any questions, Zach? Um, we do. Uh, we have a viewer asking, is surgery the only way Stay to relieve by. pressure on a nerve that is compressed by disc material causing weakness down a leg? Uh, I was informed by a neurosurgeon that over time the disc material can dissolve on its own. Is this true? He also said the surgery would not relieve pressure but only relieve pain. All right, so great question. Hopefully everybody got that. So the question was, Dr. Duke Majin, um, is it true that when you have a herniated disc, pinching a nerve, causing pressure on the nerve, that that herniation over time will shrivel up on its own and go away? The answer is rarely ever does it do that. I would say 95% of the time, if you have significant pressure on a nerve where you have weakness, it's not going to go away on its own. Do not wait. If you have weakness in your leg or arm from a herniated disc pinching a nerve, my advice is you need to get that fixed immediately. I believe that that's virtually what's called a surgical emergency. It should be done rapidly, soon, so you can get that nerve unpinched quickly. It's not going to go away on its own. Well, there's part of the herniation coming out. Um, and the surgeon told this person that Surgery will only fix pain, but not the, uh, not the weakness. So surgery um, can fix pain for sure if you have the right surgery done and it's done the right way. Um, the weakness can definitely be fixed, 100%, but it takes, it, it takes basically getting the, the pressure off the nerve quickly. And once you do that, the strength will come back. Now, it doesn't come back 100% in everybody, and you may only get 10% improvement, you may get 50, you may get 100. Everyone's different. But the harder the nerve is crushed, the longer the nerve is crushed for a longer period of time, the less likely you're gonna get your strength back. So a surgeon should operate quite quickly if a patient has weakness. I always recommend surgery to any patient that has weakness. Sometimes I get patients coming in, they say, hey doc, I have back pain and leg pain, pain shooting down my leg, but I don't want surgery, I just want shots. I'll do an exam on the patient. If they have weakness, I'm recommending surgery because it's, it's really below the standard of care to not recommend surgery, in my opinion, to a patient who has weakness. If a patient has damage to their spinal cord or weakness, they must be recommended for surgery right away. That's my opinion. A and I think that that's the standard of care in neurosurgery. I don't know what kind of surgeon you're dealing with, maybe an orthopedic surgeon, but it doesn't sound like a neurosurgeon to me, but it could be. There are some bad neurosurgeons out there. All right, so this is the annular tear that I always talk about. It's like a little blue slice that just goes through and through. 
and it's very scarred up. And this right here is the interposed nucleus. This is the herniation. It's coming from the core out towards me. And uh, I got to zap it away so the annulus can heal. The annulus is wanted to heal. You see a lot of scar tissue right where the tip is here. That's the effort of the annulus to heal over years. And it just has not been able to because the nucleus propulsus is wedged in there. And that nucleus just keeps creating more and more inflammation, chronic inflammation. So I hope I made myself clear in answering that question. Anyone with weakness should have surgery right away as soon as possible. And you need what's called a decompression, where you're taking the pressure off the nerve. The disc itself will not shrivel up and go away on its own. That just doesn't happen. It's a myth. It's nonsense. I, I think I know where it comes from, and I don't want to say because I don't want to be offensive, but I think it mostly comes from chiropractors who want patients to understand, oh, yeah, if we do chiropractic therapy, your disc will shrivel up and go away. So don't go get surgery. Just stay with me, the chiropractor, and I'll fix you. Um, the reality is, is that those herniations don't go away on their own. Uh, I've never, I, that's all I deal with every day is herniated discs and the neck and back. And I can tell you, uh, I may be seeing one out of a thousand that will go away on its own. Now, will symptoms go away? Yes, symptoms can go away. In other words, the pain down your leg, the weakness may improve a little bit. Numbness may improve a little bit on its own with time. But generally, when you have weakness going on, you don't want to wait because you're just going to get permanent nerve damage. So I recommend my patients get surgery as soon as possible. If they have nerve pinch, weakness, or spinal cord pinch, and they have weakness, that needs to be addressed immediately surgically. You'll get different opinions from different people, but um, that's kind of like, uh, to me, it's kind of like, I'm going to take my car on a trip. Should I fill the gas tank with gas or not? It's obvious the answer is yes. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know a better way to explain it. I don't know why a doctor would say you don't need it. I, I don't know if it's ignorance uh, or if it's they're just lazy. I don't know if it's an insurance issue. I, I just don't know. But there's really no good reason not to operate on a patient who has a nerve that's pinched and they've got weakness as a result of it. Uh, unless the surgeon is so bad they're afraid of themselves and they're afraid of harming the patient. In that case, that kind of surgeon needs to hang up their hat and they need to, uh, you know, go do something else in life other than surgery. It's just not appropriate to have a patient with a herniated disc pinching a nerve or spinal cord and they have weakness as a result or any kind of progressive neurological deficit where they're losing strength, losing sensation, losing bowel and bladder control, it doesn't matter. Any of those that are progressive, they have to uh, have surgery. So this is all herniation. You see that stuff coming out? That was uh, out where um, the nerve is, but I kind of shoved it in. Standby laser. When I put the dilator in, remember I banged the dilator in? So that actually pushes some of the herniation in, in back into the disc, and now I've got to go retrieve those fragments because they're at risk for basically coming back out again after surgery. So we don't want that to happen. Take, you got to, yeah. We have another question. Sure. Uh, we have a viewer says, I've been in pain uh, one and a half years, nerve pain down my leg and hip. Uh, yep. Would the surgery be an option? So I've had pain for one and a half years, nerve pain down my leg and hip. Would this surgery be an option? The answer is yes, it would. Stand by laser. Well, that's a big herniation coming out. The answer is yes, for sure, if your pain is from a herniated disc. Okay? So that's the first thing that I would need to establish to determine whether you'd be a good surgical candidate for this surgery is, are you having, do you have a herniated disc, and is that herniated disc causing your back and leg pain? If the answer is yes, and, and by the way, it most likely is, but if it is yes, then yes, this is the perfect surgery for you. This is the surgery that you want done because there's no open surgery done. There's no bone removed. There's no hospitalization. There's no hospital stay. All of this is done outpatient. So you basically go home an hour after your surgery. And you can go back to work the next day with this kind of surgery. It's so minimally invasive that a lot of people go back to work 
desk job, light duty, they go back to work the next day. Because they don't want to be out of work. They want to make money. They have a, a living to make. And um, you will need to do light activities, though. You want to restrict your lifting to about 25 pounds for the first six weeks. And you want to restrict your physical activity in the sense that you don't want to be doing contact sports like football or rugby or lacrosse. You need to wait and let your disc heal. And that takes time. So I'm really just zapping away with a laser at the herniation, kind of the base of the herniation right now. And I'm looking to the s outside laterally because you got to make sure you deal with the lateral part of the herniation. That's the part that goes to the side because you can still hit the nerve out here to the side. And so this is all scarred up herniation right here. See how white, how it's white and thick, collagenous. It's like tendrils of collagen just from chronic inflammation. And the golden color you're seeing is cal calcium, calcification. So remember, your, your inflammatory response to chronic inflammation is to make collagen, or scar tissue as collagen, and then to also um, calcify it. So a lot of people don't know to do that lateral component. But patient will know if you don't do it. They'll wake up and they'll still have leg pain. And you don't want that. These people travel far. They put their lives on hold. They take huge risks just to have surgery. They deserve to get the very best. Now what you're seeing here is fat. Those are fat cells. You can actually see individual cells. Every one of those little balloons is, a, is an individual cell. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit better. Um, not zoom, but um, focus, sorry. I think we're just overexposed. Maybe we can turn the exposure down one click. So yeah, each of those little things, you can see them. It looks like, they look like uh, frog eggs almost. That's, each one is a fat cell. That's the kind of magnification we're seeing with the endoscope. <coughs> so we can see right inside the disc. And I'm just about done with this one. There's a little bit more to get. And then I'll be done. I'm trying to get more medial by angling more medially. See all that? That herniation is kind of wrinkling up there as I zap it with the laser. We have a question. Sure. Uh, we review asking uh, how long will this patient have to wait until they will be able to golf? How long will this patient have to wait until they're able to golf? So this kind of surgery, I tell people they need to wait two weeks before they can start golfing. Um, what I would tell them is that he can start playing uh, putting, basically, playing a short game, just putting, and uh, in two weeks with his back brace on. And then after uh, two weeks, he can start going a little bit longer, but definitely not driving. There's no driving. You don't want to drive the ball for about three months. So we're just talking about short and mid-range games for the first three months, but starting at two weeks. All right, just about done here. Almost done. Dr. Santiago, you want to add anything? How's the patient doing? You're doing a little jaw thrust. Huh? All right, so after this, we're going to go to L5-S1. You may remember L5-S1 has a spondylolisthesis, grade, pretty much grade, almost grade 2. And he has a pars defect there where the bone has been cracked and slipping. Yeah, there's another piece of herniation right there. And this right here is the posterior ligament, posterior longitudinal ligament.
So Duke Spine Institute does offer fellowships in spine surgery and interventional pain management, both. Um, so if you're a, a doctor or you know of a surgeon that maybe could use some extra training, we offer spine surgery fellowship taught by a board certified neurosurgeon, AKA me. And Dr. Patel is in charge of the interventional fellowship. All right, just about done here, looking lateral. I'm very happy. We've gotten all the herniation out. And uh, like I said, this is gonna allow the disc to heal properly now that we remove the herniated disc out. It was the herniation stuck in there, like this right here. It was stuck in there and it just would not allow the annulus to heal. It set up chronic inflammation within the annulus. That's why we've got all this granulation tissue, a little bit of pinkiness right there. And the, the nerve should be right up here. Let's go take a look. There's the nerve right in there in that fat. Nice and protected. Herniation's gone. And I'm happy. All this stuff will heal nicely in the next few months. So, all done. Laser off. Beautiful surgery. No bone has been removed. Every other, every other disc surgery done. Uh, microdiscectomies, endoscopic or um, microendoscopic discectomy. All of them basically require removing bone, the lamina. It's called a laminotomy and removing part of the facet joint called a partial facetectomy. You don't want to do that because that's going to weaken the patient's spine. But every surgeon does that when they do the open spine surgeries. That's what we're avoiding here. We're avoiding removing any bone in this patient because we're going around the bone through a natural opening in the spine called the neuroforamen. That's why this is called a transforaminal approach. It's very special, but unfortunately most surgeons don't know how to do it. They have no, no clue how to do this surgery. I would say 99% of spine surgeons in the world don't know how to do this type of spine surgery. It's that advanced and that new. Go ahead and go lateral. We have a question. Sure. Uh, we have a viewer asking, uh, in your experience, what is the long-term success rate of this kind of operation, and what's the likelihood of having to have further treatment? All right, so somebody's saying, what's the long-term success for the surgery? What's the likelihood of needing another surgery? So I'm going to answer both of those questions. We've actually went back and reviewed all of our data, all of our patient outcome data. Uh, that was done independently. It was done retrospectively. And what we found was that on average, with six years of follow-up, six years average follow-up, that the patients had 95% relief of their back pain that they had before surgery, and 95% relief of their leg pain that they had before surgery. So 95% relief of back and leg pain at six years average follow-up. That means some people had seven, eight years, some people had four, uh, sorry, some people had five because our cutoff was five years. So we would not look at data that was younger than five years. In other words, every patient included in the study, and we looked at every patient, had a minimum of five years of follow-up. And the average was six years for the whole group. And it was 95% relief of back, 95% relief of leg pain. So the surgery is very durable. We have long-term data outcomes, and that, that was published um, at one of the meetings, I can't remember which meeting, this was like two years ago. Um, and then as far as the need for additional surgery, there's a 1% chance that patients will re-herniate where I operated. So they'll do something they're not supposed to do and they'll get a, another herniation right where I did surgery. Now, one of the nice things about this Duke laser disc repair surgery you're watching is we don't get adjacent segment disease because we're not fusing anything. We're not putting any metal, we're not fusing, we're not removing bone, so patients don't get adjacent segment disease. Shot, is that it right there? So they, uh, they don't have problems in other areas as a result of my surgery. Shot. Man, that's terrible, is that really? It's so grainy. You gotta make a better picture than that. 
I can't work with that. So you're watching a surgery that's live, unedited, and uh, we don't edit our surgeries. We basically show you everything. Is that is that the picture? So you're going to encounter the same problems that we encounter during the surgery. You're going to get to see how we deal with it, and everything is done, you know, in in real time. That's not that's not good enough for me. So drop the table a little bit, maybe bring the collimator in, but you got to figure out a way to get me a better picture. <coughs> Shot. All right, that's better. That's better. All right, so <coughs> I placed the guide wire through the needle. I'm going to bring the needle out. Shot. I can still see the guide wire. I can see the tip of the guide wire, which is very important. You don't want the tip advancing. You don't want the tip going back. Kay. Any movement of the tip is bad, except for a few millimeters. Shot. All right, it looks good. So... Yeah, this was a very tough one to get to for a lot of reasons. Um, and we were very lucky that we actually got to it. So I don't want to do anything that's going to compromise our ability to fix this at this point. Shot. Shot. But this is definitely our last... God, is there any way you can give me a better picture shot? Once you get Monica in here, I, I think that's acceptable, but we're really on the edge of acceptable. Once you get her in here. This is definitely the hardest level to get to normally. And honestly, <laughs> we have a very nice patient. Um, so I don't want to say anything, but this is, this is a challenge. I mean, really a challenge, even for someone like me who's done a thousand. Um, I rarely have given up on a level because it's not safe to do and I just can't access it. But um, we're really lucky that we got into this level. I was very concerned at one point that we weren't going to make it. Shot. All right, so now we got the guide wires trapped and it's advancing. We don't want that. So I'm going to pull it back gently. Shot. All right, good. I'm going to go a little bit further in and I think we're good at that point. Shot. All right. So take that. Take that. All right. So we're in. And next, remember, so for those of you who have never seen this tube, you want to show them this thing, Zach? You see this tube? We can see it. So the whole surgery is done through this little tube. I call it the milkshake straw tube. And um, it's really tiny. And of course, there's no bone removed from the spine like other surgeries. So no big incision. It's a seven millimeter incision. The outer diameter of the tube is pretty much seven millimeters and the incision is seven millimeters. So it's uh, as minimally invasive spine surgery as it gets. There's nothing less invasive than this. This is the smallest incision and least invasive shot. And we actually got, um, we're going to get all three discs done with one incision shot. So we didn't have to do a second incision shot. Shot. All right. I think that's good. Now, for those of you who have seen me do these surgeries before, you may recall that typically this tube is like further down here. And that just goes to show you, typically it's here. 
that shows you like how high up we had to go to, s to kind of get the right angle. Um, very unusual. This is probably the, the steepest L5S1 slope I've ever had to do. All right, get, get the floor out, please. I think this guy has a record for the steepest, so. And that's just the way he was born. People are born with that. There's nothing you can do about it. It's just part of the anatomical variation that we see. I'm just happy we were able to get it done. Or get it accessed at least. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Can you believe how far north I am? I could almost administer anesthesia from here. I'm so far north for L5S1. But there's the disc material, right? And uh, so we're lucky we were able to get in here and get this done. Any more questions from our audience? Not yet. Are we doing rhizotomy? Oh, right, we're not doing it. We talked about it. Yeah, I think his pain is discogenic. I don't think he's going to need a rhizotomy. So we had a little talk about that. If he needs it, we'll do it tomorrow or the next day right. before he leaves. But I don't think he's going to need it personally. Could be wrong, but we'll see. All right, so I've taken a lot of the free pieces out. I'm going to, free fragments we call it. I'm going to bring the laser in for our last disc. This is the L5S1. We've already done 3445. Is our next patient here ready to go? Please do. All right, so we're bringing our laser in. I need some fresh coffee too. Is your phone working now, doctor? Santiago, is your phone working? Good. And I told Sonny I want one phone in every OR working. Do you know if that's happened, Luis? Um, I'm not sure if there's one happening All right. So what are you going to do? You're going to make sure it happens. Right? Yes, sir. Personal responsibility. Yes, sir. This is, this is your house. Este es su casa. Right? You're not going to let people do things in your house that you don't want or not, not do things that you want done. Yes, right? Yes, sir. Yay, yay. Stand by, laser. Wipe. Are you able to see, Luis? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Man, I'm, almost, I'm up against his rib cage. That's how high. That's how, no, 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 no. I'm fine. I'm just amazed that really uh, the anatomy, the a anatomical constraints. A so big tear right there, big, big, big tear. Now remember, this disc was not so painful for him in terms of axial pain, but it was pinching his nerve. And so this is more of a unpinch the nerve level rather than a uh, get rid of the back pain and debride the annulus level. So something that we haven't talked about, but I think it's important that, that future healthcare providers understand. When a patient comes in complaining of ridiculous symptoms, so what are ridiculous symptoms? Ridiculous symptoms are symptoms in the arm or leg due to the nerve root, okay? Hence the term ridicular, the nerve radical or ra radical. So basically a nerve root. And there's really four types of ridiculous symptoms patients can have. They can have numbness in their arm or leg. They can have weakness in their arm or leg. They can have tingling, paresthesias, like it fell asleep in their arm or leg. And they can have pain going down into the arm or leg. Four ridiculous symptoms. Now, something that I want to be documented so when I'm long gone, Doctors will understand. Patient doesn't have to have compression, physical compression of the nerve root to get those symptoms. That's what most doctors believe, if not all doctors believe, that a patient has to have compression or pressure on the nerve root to get pain, weakness, numbness, or tingling. 
what I have found in my career is that if you have an annular tear and there's no herniation pinching the nerve, you can still have those symptoms from a chemical irritation of the nerve root from the annular tear and the interposed nucleus. Even though there's nothing directly pinching the nerve, it's the chemical irritation from the annular tear and the herniation that will cause those radicular symptoms. So that's part of the problem that I hear from patients that come to me from around the world. They say, my doctor told me there's nothing that needed to be done because I have a small herniation and it's not pinching my nerve. So if your goal is to fix large herniations that just pinch nerves, if that's why you're a doctor, then go ahead and live by that. But if your goal is to help people get out of pain and fix human beings that are suffering, then you need to pay attention and understand that a large number of patients that need help, that need surgery will come and they won't have a huge disc herniation pinching the nerve. They'll have a small bulge and that will be burning the nerve basically through chronic inflammatory juices leaking from the tear and the herniation onto the nerve root itself. Now, if I said this to 100 of my colleagues, maybe two of them would know what I'm talking about. The other 98 would, would say, gosh, Dr. Duke doesn't know what he's talking about. The guy needs to go back to school. But what they don't understand is I'm far beyond their level of understanding of the body when it comes to spine and that they're completely wrong and they're misled. And, you know, it's dogma like that that has really kept medicine somewhat, so to speak, especially spine surgery, somewhat in the dark ages. Uh, spine surgery, we sh this surgery you're watching right now should be being done by every spine surgeon in the United States. There's absolutely no reason it shouldn't be. But unfortunately, there are powers and forces that are preventing this technology from coming out. And that's one of the reasons we do what we do, folks. That's one of the reasons we broadcast. The biggest force, I can tell you what it is. It's the companies that manufacture the screws and rods that do fusions. They don't want this surgery out there. They have been against it from the very beginning. They have tried to stop me from teaching other people about it. And they literally have tried to block me from teaching other surgeons. Because they don't want this surgery out there. They don't want people to know about it because literally it's gonna stop them from making money on screws and rods and cages in the spine, okay? So very, very powerful. These are companies like Medtronic, uh, used to be Synthes, but Synthes is sold. It's now part of Depew. Uh, Alphatech, Nuvasiv, Globus, Stryker, all these big, big, big companies that make billions a year, grabber, selling screws and rods and cages to uh, hospitals to put in patient spines. They're basically gonna be put out of business when every spine surgeon knows how to do this surgery because we don't put any screws and rods. We don't need to. This is far more advanced. And they're afraid of this technology and they've done everything in Washington DC. They've done everything with Medicare. They've done everything with commercial insurances to block this surgery. And that's one of the reasons why we broadcast, folks. We're rebels, but we're rebels with a cause. Our purpose is to educate the public about what's out there. I don't believe in lying to people about healthcare or anything for that matter. Um, I believe in telling people the truth. And um, that's why we broadcast. We broadcast on my dime. I pay for this. I get nothing for it. Nobody pays me to broadcast. We don't have commercial breaks. Um, I pay for all this myself. And I do it for one reason. I do it so people are aware of the truth. So they can make informed decisions about their own health care. And not have to rely on big companies that make gazillions of dollars by fusing their spines. It makes me sick when I know that the truth is not being told to the public. I don't believe that's right. It's unethical. It goes against my personal beliefs. It goes against my professional beliefs. I believe people need to know the truth. So I hide nothing. I have my faults. I accept them. 
I'm not perfect, but I'm perfectly happy letting people know what my faults are. I don't try to be everything to everyone. But one thing I do know is that people need to be aware that the old ways of doing spine surgery with bolts and nuts, even though I do that myself, and I do it mostly because patients, some of the patients I take care of can't afford to do the laser surgery if it's not covered by their insurance. And so they're stuck with what their insurance will pay for. And their insurance will pay for nuts and bolts, even though it's more expensive. And the reason for that is the insurance companies don't want the laser surgery out there. They don't want it out there because they know that for every 10 patients that are recommended for fusion, one of them will get a fusion. So they only have to pay for one surgery. But for every 10 patients recommended for laser, all 10 will get the laser. So now they gotta pay for 10 surgeries. Even though the laser surgery is a lot cheaper, when you're paying 10 times as much, you're gonna be spending more money. So people come to me and say, I don't understand why the insurance, some insurances won't cover it. It's cheaper. It's faster recovery. And the reason is simple. If I gave you a choice of having dessert, and I gave you a choice of having your favorite dessert, you know, a chocolate uh, vanilla sundae with lots of fudge and marshmallows and whipped cream, okay, versus having a Jolly Rancher, you know. I don't know if Jolly Rancher is the right one, but something that nobody really wants for dessert. Let's just say rice pudding, because that's something that my grandmother used to make and I hated it. But let's say your choice was rice pudding versus a, a chocolate sundae. Of course, everyone's gonna choose the chocolate sundae, right? So my point is the insurance companies know that, that's why they're trying to keep the surgery from being out there. We're done. So at this point, I'll take more questions when I get to the conference room. We're basically done. We're gonna wrap things up. Thank you for watching, but I'll go ahead and type up your questions and I'll be happy to answer them for you. All right. All right, let me have a blue towel. Sounds like he's sleeping and snoring nicely, blissfully. I think we lost three drops of blood, maybe five. So we really didn't lose much blood. Um, these surgeries are pretty much bloodless. Uh, I would say total we lost probably three cc's max. Go ahead and put some pressure. Oh, um, Zach, let's go ahead and show the audience the, uh, the incision that we did the whole surgery through. So remember, we did three discs. Can you all see this? We can see it. I mean, there's my finger, right? I got a pretty big finger, but you can see how small that incision is. One incision, we're putting pressure on the muscle to keep a hematoma from forming. I don't think it's going to form as long as the blood pressure is low, controlled, and as long as you have good surgical technique, you shouldn't have a hematoma. But th the hematoma does get into the muscle and it causes real bad irritation of the muscle. And we don't want that for our patient because it, it makes them have more pain and muscle spasms. All right, hopefully you enjoyed watching the Duke Laser Disc Repair here in Melbourne, Florida, Space Coast of Florida. If you know anybody suffering, go ahead and get them to do a free MRI review and a video conference, all free, no charge. And I actually do those myself personally. How come the garbage can is covered? Oh well, thank you. All right, that's fine. You have a pin? So Zach, go ahead and get those questions ready and I'll come over there and answer them. Yes, sir. Good job, everybody. Great work today. Uh, thank you.
Okay, this is Dr. Duke Majin here, and we're back with you, and we're in uh, Command Central here with Zach. I'm going to look over the questions, and we'll answer the questions for you. So our first question is, will you need to be on any pain meds after this surgery? So one of our viewers made the very astute observation that the incision is so small, do you really need to be on pain medication? So great question. There's different kinds of pain meds. And just for our general audience, we're going to talk about the different kinds of pain meds just really briefly. So the first type of pain med that everyone's most probably most familiar with is called an anti-inflammatory. And anti-inflammatories are things that you can get over the counter, sorry, like Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naprosyn, BC powder. Those are just some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, very common, over-the-counter, non-prescription pain medication. Obviously, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have risk. There's not just all benefit. The risks associated with them are increased risk of kidney disease, ulcers in the stomach or uh, duodenum, and uh, increased risk of cardiovascular events like stroke or heart attack. Okay, so... Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are one type of pain med. A second class of pain med are called muscle relaxers, muscle relaxers. And their really technical name is antispasmodic. So basically they stop the muscles from tightening up. And those are medicines like Flexeril and um, um, Cyclobenzaprine, uh, Soma. Um, you know, Valium is a very powerful one, but we don't use it because it has too many side effects. Um, Robaxin is another one. So there's probably about 10 different muscle relaxers out there. And uh, the third category of pain medication that many people have heard about are called opioids. Opioids or, or AKA narcotics. Narcotics are a type of pain medication that binds to the opioid receptors and has an effect of reducing pain. So we have anti-inflammatories, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We have muscle relaxers. We have narcotic opioid painkillers. And then there's a final class, which are nerve stabilizers. They include gabapentin, which is Neurontin, um, Lyrica, et cetera. So do we use any of these af after surgery for this type of surgery? The answer is we use um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So patients that have the duke laser disc repair don't need pain meds except for Tylenol or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We don't need any narcotics. And that, thank you for asking the question because that really highlights another huge difference between the endoscopic surgery that I do here at Duke Spine Institute to repair the discs compared to open surgery, whether you're having a fusion or a laminectomy or a microdiscectomy or an artificial disc. All those open surgeries require narcotic painkillers. And many of those surgeries require you on the narcotic painkillers, muscle relaxers for many months after surgery. But with the Duke laser disc repair, you're basically on Tylenol and ibuprofen for a day or two, and that's it. So big, big difference in the amount of postoperative pain. Thank you for asking. Next question. How long will you expect this laser surgery to last? So great question. Someone's saying, Dr. Duke Majin, really like the laser surgery, but how long is it going to last? Does this last uh, more than a year, two years, ten years? So great question. How long does any surgery last, right? Nobody really knows for sure, but based on my 13 years of doing this surgery, 
this surgery, the Duke laser disc repair that you just watched lasts a lifetime, for sure. We have many, many patients that um, probably 95% of our patients, the uh, surgery lasts their entire lifetime. So this is a permanent fix. It's not a temporary, it's not like a shot, like an epidural where it's gonna wear off. The Duke laser disc repair surgery is a permanent fix. It's expected to last the entire life of the patient, unless the patient re-injures it doing something they're not supposed to do. Great question. Next. That was our last question. So we'll wait around for another minute in case you have another question. Just say, hey, got another question, and we'll, we'll stick around. Otherwise, we have another Duke laser disc repair. We'll be starting in about 30 minutes. This next patient is having, again, L45, L5S1 pain in their lower back and down their right leg. And they're having a lot of calf pain, a lot of pain going into their foot on the right side. Um, and they have two herniations, one at L45, one at L5S1. All right. So no more questions, Zach? We just got a question. All right. <laughs> right at the bell, right? Spelling? L-E-B-O-R-T-H-A-N-O-L. All right, so someone's asking, what are your thoughts on a medication called Leberphanol? Leberphanol? Um, I don't know that medicine. I'm completely uh, unaware of what it is. And so what are your thoughts on it? I don't have any thoughts on it because I've never heard of it before. Either it's being spelled incorrectly or if it's spelled correctly, I've never heard of that medicine. Great question, though. Thank you. I'll try to look it up in, during the break and, uh, and see if I can figure out what it is. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching, listening, and asking questions, participating. We've got another surgery coming up in about 30 to 45 minutes. Hope you enjoyed the Duke Laser Disc Repair. I enjoyed talking with you and hanging with you.